So just a moment before I begin, I want to introduce myself and our group. So I'm a graduate student in Tatiana Bolandova's lab, um, where we apply MES and mass spectroscopy to study viruses, cytoskeleton proteins, uh, cytoskeleton associated proteins, and methyl development to study the structure and dynamics. Um, I'm specifically involved in MAS and MAR methods development and studies of bacteriophage P22, but today I will not discuss this project. Um, instead, the reason I'm talking here today is because we recently published a review on virus structures and dynamics by Magic Chemical Spinning in MR in Annual Review of Virology. I welcome you to read it, especially if you are interested in deeper biological implications of MAS and MAR studies in virology in general. And just for perspective, here on the right is a list of all the viruses we covered in the review, although many other viruses were studied as well. So today I would like to cover three topics. I'll begin first with talking about viruses, some structural characteristics uh, typical to viruses and how these render MAS and MR, a remarkable tool for the study. Then I will introduce biomolecular MAS and MR, how MAS works, how we use it to study biological systems and what unique information can be obtained. And at last, I'll show you several examples that demonstrate the power of MAS and mass spectroscopy in the study of viruses and the unique insights that are otherwise difficult to achieve. So first of all, viruses are simply genetic material encapsulated and protected by proteins. One property that is common to all viruses is they, they cannot self-replicate, self but instead depend on the host cell mechanisms and resources. But in general, most viruses go through a similar life cycle. So the virion detects the host cell through a receptor and then either enters with the whole capsid, shown here as in a cosahedral capsid, or just the genomic material, um, though releasing it into the cell. Then the viral genomic material is replicated and expressed to create viral proteins in a more viral uh, genome, which then self-assemble into new virions that release the host cell to infect others. Um, now, however, an important feature of viruses is their variety. Viruses can be categorized and differed through many structural features. So, for example, some have an icosahedral um, capsid like the papillomavirus and influenza A, for example, as a helical nucleocapsid and it is an enveloped virus. Uh, bacteriophages, many of them um, do not have an envelope and some actually have a capsid attached to a tail. Some bacteriophages are just um, filamentous, like bacteriophage M13, and so on and so on. So viruses have a really large variety of structural features and morphologies. Now, so why is MAS and MR so well suited to study viruses? So first of all, MAS and MR has no inherent size limitation. So it means that, for example, instead of just studying protein monomers, we can study whole viral capsids and even with their genomic material encapsulated, and in some cases uh, that I'll show you later, we can also study intact viruses. Um, two, we can pack in the MAS rotor almost any solid, it can be powder, hydrated lipids, microcrystalline proteins, and sediments of large bi bi biological assemblies. And um, in general, it's, um, it's interesting. So for biological assemblies that, that um, on the mega datum scale, it is relatively simple to just sediment them straight into the MAS rotor, um, thus enabling um, uh, um, relatively easy way to study them by magic angle spinning in MR and to achieve high resolution spectra as well. Third, a broad range of experimental conditions are available, especially when working with sediments, since we can avoid specific crystallization conditions. So one interesting option is to work at cryogenic temperature, for example, which I'll show you later as well, to attenuate dynamics in proteins or um, or uh, changing the temperature um, to higher temperature and uh, variable pH levels. Four, MAS and MR can be used to study the secondary tertiary structure of the target protein, as well as dynamics on many time scales and different lengths. So it could be either dynamics of a specific domain or even a single, single side chain dynamics. Even, in, in, and even more than that, we can accurately measure distances between nuclei and spin labels. And five, is that MES and MR provides unique physical chemical information on the, on the local environment of the detected nuclei. So it includes the ability to identify binding pockets, detect hydrogen bonds, investigating interactions between membrane proteins and lipids and more. So overall, MES and MR offers a comprehensive toolbox to study biomolecular assemblies, 
providing a broad range of experimental conditions and physical chemical information. And for viruses, MASNMR allows investigation of large complexes like capsids or intact virions and with remarkable resolution and wealth of information. So now the only question is how we do that with M magic angle spinning and MR. Uh, so I'll now briefly cover the fundamentals of biomolecular magic angle spinning and MR spectroscopy. Um, so let's begin by talking first about the basics of NMR spectroscopy. So in solution NMR, we usually observe two major spin interactions. We observe the isotropic chemical shift and the J-coupling, which we utilize to transfer magnetization between nuclei. However, there are other two significant spin interactions that affect the spectra of immobile samples. The anisotropic part of the chemical shift, which is the chemical shift anisotropy, and the dipolar coupling. Now, in solution NMR, these interactions are averaged because small molecules tumble relatively fast in solution. But on the other hand, in solid state, these interactions are not averaged anymore by fast movement. So, um, so uh, the chemical shift anisotropy and dipolar couplings introduce severe line broadening. So, overall, sharp lines in solution NMR are the result, are in fact the result of fast tumbling and dynamics. But on the other hand, in the case of solids and large biological assemblies in solution, the anisotropic interactions are not averaged, resulting in rather broad and amount lines. However, these anisotropic spin interactions can be averaged by spinning the solid sample with very uh, spinning the solid sample very fast in a rotor at an angle of 54.7 degrees with respect to the external magnetic field. Um, uh, that angle is also called the metric angle, and therefore the method is called metric angle spinning NMR. Now you can see, for example, that a glycine uh, carbon-13 spectrum without spinning, here denoted as static, um, has very broad lines. And specifically, um, if you look at the C-alpha signal and carbonyl signal, we see the carbonyl signal has broader lines. This is really because carbonyl has larger chemical shifts and isotropy. But when we start spinning the sample around the magic angle at relatively slow MAS frequencies, we see features in the spectrum that are called spinning sidebands, which you can see around the isotropic chemical shift. These are the result of spinning echoes created because the anisotropic interactions are not fully averaged. But at about 10 kilohertz, MAS frequency is sufficiently high. And the most prominent features in the carbon-13 spectrum are the isotropic shifts of C alpha and the carbonyl signal. On the other hand, proton spectra are more difficult to obtain at these MES frequencies. The line broadening of protons in the salt state is mostly caused by the large network of dipolar coupling proton-proton uh, spins because the proton java kinetic ratio is much larger than that of carbon-13. So its dipolar couplings are stronger and therefore faster MES frequencies are required. So you can see here, for example, for glycine, we can only see the free uh, protons resolved around 40 kilohertz, still not very good. But when we go up to higher MAS frequencies of 60 and 100 kilohertz, um, resolution uh, keeps increasing. So to summarize, carbon-13 detected experiments require MAS frequencies above 10 kilohertz, give and take, and are usually conducted at MAS frequencies of about 10 to 25 kilohertz. Um, these are nowadays often called slow MAS. Now, when spinning at MAS frequencies above 40 and 60 kilohertz, proton lines narrow down and sensitivity-wise, proton detection becomes both feasible and preferable due to the jump magnetic ratio difference. So faster MAS frequencies, narrower proton lines and higher sensitivity. So now that we understand this principle of MAS and MAS spectroscopy, I want to review the process of protein structure determination by magic angle spinning in MR. So first, the sample is prepared and isotopically labeled and then packed into an MAS rotor. Now, MAS rotors vary in sizes, which determine the available sample volume and maximal MAS frequencies. So in this figure, for example, we have the uh, sample volume in red in microliters, the maximum uh, MAS frequency in orange in kilohertz, and the outer diameter in, mil in millimeter. So let's say, for example, the 3.2 millimeter rotor, which is commonly used, um, can spin at up to 24 kilohertz. So we would uh, mostly do carbon detected experiments, and the sample volume is about 30 microliters. But if we want to spin faster, let's say at 67, then we would need smaller rotor, let's say 1.3 millimeter. Um, but um, when we do that, the sample volume decreases by almost about, by about 15 times less. 
However, again, because we um, achieve higher sensitivity by detecting through protons at those MES frequencies, then, um, then there is come some kind of balance between uh, the sensitivity of both rotors. And um, even more than that, if we go to smaller rotors that can spin even faster at 100 and 130 and 150 kilohertz, the uh, sample amount actually is even is on the sub milligram level and getting close to uh, microgram quantities. Now, once the sample is packed, we can put it in the MAS and MR probe, place the probe in the magnet, and record multidimensional spectra. Now, an important difference between the design of solution and solid state and MR experiments are the magnetization transfers. So, while solid state and MR experiments um, usually rely on dipolar coupling, due to, sorry, so solid state and MR experiments, unlike solution, rely mostly on the dipolar coupling to, because the um, T2 accelerator rates are much shorter. So while fast spinning around the magic angle decouples the anisotropic interactions, as I mentioned, um, along the years, many pulse sequences were developed that recouple these interactions back for short periods during the experiment. And by doing so, we can transfer magnetization through the dipolar coupling or through space and not through bond like in J coupling. So let's, for example, look at a 2D HSQC experiment. In solution, we would employ um, refocused inapt for magnetization transfer, heteronuclear. Um, but in MES and MR, the J-based in, um, inapt step is replaced with cross polarization or CP. CP is the most common technique to recouple heteronuclear dipolar coupling, and by doing so, initiating magnetization transfer between heteronuclei. So since magnetization transfer steps are through space, the experiments, the experiments collected for resonance assignments are built differently. In addition, as I said before, the MS frequency we work at dictates which nuclei is preferable to use for detection, carbon-13 or protons. Considering everything together, a different set of experiments is normally utilized for resonance assignment in proteins per MAS frequency. So for carbon-13 detector experiments, correlations like NCACX and NCLCX um, are often collected. Now, since the transfer is through space and thus non-selective, carbon-carbon mixing results in spectra that are rich in information. So for example, in the NCACX spectra, we get correlations for both NCACO, NCAC beta, and so on. In proton detected experiments, for example, and like in solution, initial magnetization transfer from protons is done directly to carbons, not through nitrogen, either for to, from proton to C alpha or to CO, even though it's not directly bonded, since it transfers through space. So to summarize, the experiments in magic angle spinning and MR are based on dipolar couplings, which require them to be designed differently compared to solution and MR. Furthermore, some experiments are optimal for different range of MAS frequencies. Therefore, we can record different information and different MAS rates. Now, besides resonance assignment, different MAS and MR experiments can be utilized for various purposes. So one is collection of distance restraints. While mostly in solution, we collect proton-proton distance restraints through nosy spectra. In the salt state, it's actually more common to collect carbon-carbon distance restraints, but not limited to and can also be proton, proton, nitrogen, carbon, and et cetera, with, in, with a variety of experiments. With some of them, we can even measure accurate distances and not just estimate range of distances. And two, dynamics. Now, besides measuring the relaxation rates, like in solution um, for, let's say, T1, T1 rho, and T2, we can also measure the magnitude of the anisotropic interactions to report on dynamics on different timescales. And moreover, specific unique insights into local, local and global structure can be obtained as well. These include histidine protonation states, characterization of genome protein interactions, specific hydrogen bonds by indirect measurement of J couplings and more. Some of those I'll actually show you in a few slides, uh, some example on viruses. And at last, after considering all the information we acquired, if it's distance restraints, chemical shifts, the hydral angles and more, we can combine it all in simulated annealing um, to determine the protein static structure. Now for protein assemblies such as viral capsids, we can combine cryam to obtain long range information even with relatively low resolution density maps. Uh, furthermore, we can integrate our results from magic angle spinning and MR and other complementary methods like X-ray and others 
um, to molecular dynamics simulations in order to gain not just a static structure, but a dynamic one of the whole biomolecular assembly that will inform us on conformations, for example, of those assemblies. So to summarize, MAS and MR datasets provide unique insights into protein structure, dynamics, and site-specific information. By combining several methods, such as CRI-IM and molecular dynamics, we can even obtain high-resolution dynamic 3D structures of large biomolecular assemblies. So now after we understand why and how magic angle spinning and MR works and how it is used to study viruses, structure and dynamics, I would like to share with you a few unique examples that demonstrate these capabilities. So before I begin this part, I want to note that um, I'm only going to show a few selected examples out of many that exist. The table below from our review includes all the viruses that were studied by magic angle spinning and MR spectroscopy um, and even out of those four examples of influenza A, hepatitis B virus, HIV-1, and filamentous phages, we're only showing selected examples of the studies were, that were done. So I'm going to begin first with influenza. So influenza, specifically influenza A, which is the virus that, ca a virus that is causing an upper respiratory disease, um, is um, a virus that causes several pandemics over the last century. The most notorious one, uh, was uh, the 1918 pandemic, and there was the most recent one from 2009, just about a decade ago, the swine flu. Um, now, while we do have vaccines, the large variety of strains and variants make it difficult to predict which variants will circulate every season, and therefore the development of therapeutics for influenza A infections is very important. Now, influenza A is an envelope virus. And one of its member proteins is a therapeutic target called matrix 2 protein, or AM2 in short. Now, AM2 forms tetramers in the viral membrane, as shown here, and is essential in viral infection. When the virus enters the host cell, AM2 is responsible for proton conduction into the virion, which is a step that is crucial for the infection mechanism in order to release the viral genomic material into the cell so it can replicate. Now, antiviral drugs such as amantadine and remantadine um, block that channel to inhibit the proton conduct conduction. Um, although most circulating variants right now of influenza A um, evolved immunity to both amantadine and remantadine, and the inhibition mechanism is of interest for the development of new therapy that overcomes the evolved resistance. So several questions are raised. How these in inhibitors bind the pore, and how the inhibitors affect the proton conduction mechanism? So several research groups around the world utilize MAS and MR to study the member protein in lipid bilayers and to answer these questions exactly. Now, May Hong group from MIT um, investigated the mantidine binding site in AM2 by magic angle spinning and MR when it's bound in lipid bilayers. Uh, using specific amino acid labeling and um, deutyl labeling of the drug, um, they employ the polar recoupling techniques to, accur to accurately measure distances between amantadine and AM2 and between different AM2 chains inside the pore. Um, as a result, they were able to solve the binding site of amantadine in the hydrated lipid bilayers of atomic resolution. Um, so now the next step is to understand how these AM2 inhibitors affect the proton conduction mechanism. So Learn and Trust group from Max Planck Institute recently investigated AM2 in lipid bilayers at very fast MAS frequencies of 80 to 100 kilohertz. They found in proton antigen dipolar-based correlation spectra that a proton at about 14.5 ppm is correlated to two different histidine nitrogen, nitrogen atoms. To one, the proton is directly bonded, which is an epsilon two, which you can see here as the proton and the nitrogen. So it's directly bonded and the correlation through space is obvious. Um, but, to, uh, but the longer distance separates a proton and the second nitrogen atom and delta one. Now, since the transfer is through space, it is possible that the second correlation is actually to a second uh, histidine side chain on another AM2 uh, monomer across the channel. So suspecting there is an inter, there is an interchain hydrogen bond around here, they conducted a 2D spectrum, which is, the past sequence appears here, um, that employs a homonuclear NAP transfer in the middle. So during those uh, tau periods, um, a J-based transfer um, occurs between nitrogen atoms. So if there is a nitrogen-nitrogen J-coupling, they would see it in that experiment in the indirect dimension. 
And indeed, they found that uh, between N epsilon two and N delta one, there is a J coupling of about nine hertz, which is indicative that there is a hydrogen bond between the proton and N delta one. In addition, they prepared a similar sample with the inhibitor rimantidine. And they saw that when a romantidine is present, the spectrum changes drastically. And specifically, the proton chemical shift that was before at 14.5 ppm is now much lower at about 8, 9 ppm around here in the red spectrum. Um, and in addition, when they tried to measure again the J coupling between the two uh, histidines, they couldn't measure any J coupling. There wasn't a 9 hertz J coupling anymore. So to summarize, MESNMO was used to identify the binding site of small molecule inhibitors in a vowel membrane channel, detect a hydrogen bond between neighbor histidine residues across the channel, and to observe the effect of the inhibitor on the local environment, supporting hypotheses that actually explain the conduction and inhibition mechanisms through uh, the existence of that hydrogen bond. So this is information that is not easily obtainable by other methods. Now, the next case study I want to talk about is the hepatitis B virus, or HBV, which is a virus that causes liver disease. Like influenza A, HBV has a viral membrane, but this time the focus is on the viral capsid, uh, struck the viral capsid. And um, um, even more than that, with uh, the interactions of it with the genomic material inside. Now, the HBV core protein consists of two domains, the assembly domain here in gray, which is sufficient actually to form capsids, which are shown here, and the C-terminal domain, which is uh, solely uh, responsible to, um, to bind to uh, encapsulated RNA and DNA inside the HBV capsid. Now, during the viral assembly mechanism, the pregenomic RNA is polymerized to relax circular DNA, and followed by the envelopment of mature virions, um, followed by obviously infections of other host cells after the viral uh, virus matures. Now, however, um, the CTD, the C-terminal domain, is functionally important, uh, but it is in invisible to other methods because it's very dynamic and has large degree of heterogeneity. MSNMA spectroscopy, on the other hand, can be used to probe either rigid or dynamic regions of the HBV core protein in whole capsids, either with or without viral RNA or DNA encapsulated. And following that thought, Beat Mayer, Anne Bachmann, and Michael Nazal groups led structural studies of the HBV capsid by MASNMR. Now, interestingly, they saw that before and after encapsulation of RNA in HBV capsids, some carbon-13 chemical shifts were changed by more than half and even one ppm, as shown here. By mapping the large chemical shift differences, or CSDs, on the dimer structure of the core protein, um, they could see that it actually revealed a hydrophobic binding pocket highlighted on the HPV core here on the right. And these two distinct conformations that they saw in the carbon-carbon correlation spectra were not affected before by other methods. Now, to test the connection between the hydrophobic pocket and the conformational change, they inserted tryptophan mutations close to the pocket, so uh, specifically uh, mutations P5W and LCCW. Um, so the roles of these mutations is to block access to the pocket. So um, if one of the conformations is the result of binding to that pocket, then a tryptophan residue would block the binding site. And indeed, only one conformation was identified in mutated capsids either before or after reassembly. So let's take, for example, these correlations of isoleucin 59, C delta 1, C beta. So um, before that, we had the blue and uh, pink, which were E. coli without our, um, um, HPV capsids produced in E. coli uh, without RNA and then with RNA after reassembly of the capsids. So um, those without RNA gave this conformation, let's say conformation A, and after reassembly with RNA, they saw conformation B. But for empty capsids with the mutations, they only achieved, they only they could only find conformation B in the capsids. And um, in the study, uh, followed those observations, they discovered actually that, that, that a detergent that they used during capsid purification uh, called Triton X100 was the molecule that was binding to that pocket, thus initiating the, that conformational change between A and B. 
So in fact, what they saw is that during the reassembly where they incorporated the RNA in the capsids, they, uh, um, um, they purified the sample out of Triton X100 during the reassembly. So they, could, they, so they only uh, found uh, conformation B. Now, if they com compare the two conformations, uh, sorry, if they compare the two samples without and with RNA, without Triton X100 involved, they could not see significant changes in the structure, specifically the chemical shifts between um, uh, uh, before and after RNA binding. So to conclude, in the MAS, MAS and MR study of the HBV capsids, they found two distinct conformations that were not resolved before. Comparison of the chemical shifts in the two conformations revealed the hydrophobic binding pockets that could have implications on the envelopment mechanism of the capsid. But even more than that, after ruling out binding to the pocket, the solid RNA binding in the capsid did not cause any significant change in the assembly domain of the HBV capsid protein. So now, although metacongal spinning and MR already revealed important features of the HBV capsid, the CDD is still invisible in the polar base spectra. So as you've seen here in the red spectrum recorded at ambient temperatures, um, no contacts were observed between the RNA and the C-terminal domain in neither carbon-carbon or carbon-nitrogen correlation spectra. And the reason these contacts do not appear in the spectrum are most likely due to dynamics. So to alleviate this issue, the groups of Bach, Anthony, Sani, Stefan Sitz, and Anne Schutz recorded spectra of the capsids at cryogenic temperatures of 100 Kelvin. They also applied DNP for sensitivity enhancement and the cryogenic DNP enhanced spectra here in blue reveal uh, in the uh, uh, squared regions around here, they reveal um, unambiguous correlations between the RNA sugars and the capsid arginine, arginine side chains. Now, in addition, they also recorded phosphorus filtered carbon-carbon uh, dipolar-based correlation spectrum uh, shown here on the right and the power sequence above. Now, the spectrum give rise to two sets of correlations around the RNA. Contacts between carbons of the ribose at chemical shifts uh, between about 16 and 100 ppm and uh, shown here, and additional intra-residue contacts within the arginine side chains of the C-terminal domain. Now, this spectrum shows that arginine side chains are in proximity with the RNA phosphate backbone because those are phosphorus filtered and indicative of, of the electrostatic interactions between arginine and the RNA. So here, we saw that MAS and MR can also be used to study whole capsids even at cryogenic temperatures to obtain information on the local environment of dynamic regions that are otherwise invisible to other methods. With filtered power sequences, such as phosphorus filtered sequences, we also directly observe residues in high proximity to RNA or DNA. And in this specific case, DNP was used for sensitivity enhancement, which allowed drastic reduction in experimental time that was required. Now for my third, my third example is the human immunodeficiency virus or um, the most common strain, HIV-1, which is the causative agent of the AIDS epidemic. Now, while mortality in the developed world has gone down thanks to developed treatments, in sub-Saharan countries, AIDS-related death toll is high and in some cases more than 10 and even 20% of total deaths. HIV-1 is a retrovirus, meaning that it can integrate its genomic material um, uh, integrate its genomic material into the host DNA. Now, that is one of the reasons HIV-1 cannot be cured, but only suppressed in um, infected individuals through antivirals. And specifically, antivirals targeting the viral capsid are of utmost interest, and therefore structural and dynamical understanding of its structure and assembly mechanisms are under extensive research. Um, HIV-1 capsids, however, have a unique conical shape. In particular, interest are the protein-protein interactions in, in, in the capsids of both the hexameric units and the pentameric units, so shown here zoomed in in green and yellow, um, and their dynamics. However, the plasticity of HIV-1 conical capsid rendered it difficult to study by both PRIAM and American Gospinning and MR. On the other hand, Tubular assemblies that contain only hexameric units of HIV-1 capsid protein or HIV-1-CA um, resemble that of the protein as in the conical capsid um, here on the left. 
So Polana Vag, Gronenbaum, and Perea groups solved the structure of the HIV-1 CA tubular assemblies, hence the hexameric, uh, the, um, hexameric unit of the conical capsid by combining three methodologies, MASNMR, CRI-IM, and molecular dynamics, or MD. So to do so, they first um, assigned the chemical shifts and both the hydral and distance, the hydral restraints and distance restraints were collected to solve the structure of a single monomer um, in the tubular assemblies. Now, the distance restraints are important to define the way the protein folds. And as I mentioned earlier in MAS and it is most common to collect carbon carbon distance restraints, which reach to about seven, eight angstroms. However, it is difficult to collect uh, enough restraints between the N and C terminal domain of the HFV1CA monomer. So to solve that issue, they dock the structure of the CA domains into a low resolution CRI-EM density map and further refine the structure um, by combining additional interchain contacts they could collect through space between the monomers. Now, even though CRI-EM density is of a, of a relatively res low resolution, just eight angstrom, um, and lacks information on more dynamics regions like um, the cyclophenic A binding loop and the linker region between the two domains, and the MAUD data provides distance restraints that guide the calculation of their conformation. And finally, by combining data guided molecular dynamics simulations, they were able to solve the structure of large tubular segments consisting of 87 hexamers or about 40 million atoms. And in addition, with the com with a combination of molecular dynamics, um, they could also um, um, uh, collect more information on the conformations of different sites in the protein that are relatively dynamic. So for example, the linker region was found to have four distinct conformation as well as a cyclophenic A binding loop of the monomer. Um, so in conclusion, hybrid, approach, appro well, hybrid approaches combining several methods together with magic and spinning and MR can mitigate the study of multi-domain proteins, large assemblies, and even provide information on conformations. Specifically, CRI-IM and molecular dynamics can assist NAS and MR studies of large protein assemblies, including viral capsids. And the combination of CRI-IM and MAS and MR to study large biomolecular assemblies has been applied to several of our systems, and two more are presented in my review. And for the last case study I want to mention, um, I want to talk about intact filamentous bacteriophages. So filamentous bacteriophages are an interesting case in solid state and MR. Because of their morphology, when intact filamentous phages are put in the NMR, signals are coming mostly from two components, the capsid protein and the circular single-stranded DNA. As you can see, all the structural proteins um, at the terminal, termini of the filament are of relatively low concentration when compared to the DNA and the major capsid protein. So when we put in the NMR, we would mostly see signals um, of those and the other components would be, would be virtually invisible compared to the signal intensity of other components. Um, now that also allows us um, very easily to study interactions, not only between the major capsid, but between the major capsid and, um, and intact DNA of those pages and to study even the way the DNA is packed inside through uh, correlations between the DNA itself. Now, the sample preparation process is slightly different from recombinantly expressed proteins. So for example, bacteriophage M13 infects E. coli. So E. coli are grown in minimal media and for isotopic labeling and are then infected with the bacteriophage of interest. The phages are then separated through several techniques and centrifugations precipitated with PAG, hydrated, and finally packed into the MAS rotor. So first of all, as seen in the example here of the deep bacteriophage, intact phages give high resolution spectra indicating of high symmetry of the major capsid protein of the bacteriophage. The same is true for other intact phages investigated by Magic and Gospinning and MR. But one of the biggest advantages, as I said, of studying intact virions is the ability to observe capsid DNA correlations since both are isotopically labeled. So for example, in this carbon-carbon correlation spectrum of PF1, the DNA correlations are assigned showing both correlations within the DNA used for assignment of the DNA chemical shifts and to study the way it is packed, 
and correlations with specific amino acids of the capsid protein and the DNA. And specifically here for PF1, DNP enhanced experiments, again, uh, were used to record um, the data sets at 100 Kelvin to study the structure of the packed single stranded DNA. Uh, so to conclude, MAS and MR provide unique insights into filamentous bacteriophages. Their morphology allow us to perform structural characterization within intact viruses and rendering protein genome contacts accessible. In addition, not shown here, the DNA organization inside the capsid can be studied as well. And specifically, these contacts may be observed at either ambient or cryogenic temperatures, depending mostly on dynamics and sensitivity. So now to summarize everything I've told you today, MAS and mouse spectroscopy can be used to study a large variety of viruses and viral systems, including intact viruses, viral capsids, and membrane proteins. For all these systems, not only atomic protein information, structural information can be obtained, but also protein genome interactions, dynamics, and identification of conformational heterogeneity, and much more than that. So with that, I would just like to uh, thank my PhD advisor, Tatiana Polonova, uh, from which I learned a lot during my time here in Delaware. And I keep learning and exploring new frontiers every day. And also, of course, I owe a lot of my progress and knowledge to every single person in our group, um, either new students and students who already graduated, uh, with which every discussion helped to deepen my understanding of magic angle spinning and the mass spectroscopy and the biological aspects. And also, if you're interested in a graduate student position or postdoctoral position, and you're also interested in magic angle spinning and MR spectroscopy, I encourage you to email us. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you all for listening, and I will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gal. That was great. Uh, it was very informative, uh, and I really enjoyed all the examples that you that you shared. Thank you. Um, so if people have questions, I encourage you to enter them in the Q&A, uh, and I will uh, go through them and read them off. Um, to give people a little time to answer questions, I, I'll, I'll start us off. So I have a question about, uh, in many of your examples, you showed how you can combine cryo-EM, in, in particular, pretty low-resolution cryo-EM images with solid-state mm -hmm. NMR uh, to get structural information. So I'm wondering, what are the limits on uh, on the resolution of the cryo-EM images that are useful? Uh, you know, how, how high does the resolution have to be before you can get useful global information that way? Um, I can't give you specific numbers on that. Uh, I don't think a um, specific study was done to see what is the lowest resolution that can be used for that. But um, I can say at least that um, um, eight angstrom, for example, and even lower resolution, um, Actually, for other example that we showed in the review, um, they used about uh, also six angstrom, but again, even eight angstrom, which is again relatively uh, low compared to um, the benchmark, let's say today in cryoEM, and still it was very useful for that protein uh, for that example. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so um, this is sort of a more general question, but I, I would, I'd, uh, I'd, maybe you could explain a little bit uh, what the range of uh, dynamics are that you can easily access and the different techniques that you would use mm. to access with solid state NMR? So um, I had a hidden slide for that, but it's not here, but I will say anyway. Um, so generally through anisotropic interactions, you can mostly see nanosecond to millisecond dynamics and some experiments, for example, uh, codec, which is showed in the table way back. Yeah, so for example, experiments like deep shift, pulse, and RCSA can be used to um, look at dynamics on the millisecond to nanosecond timescales. Uh, codex can be used to look on millisecond to second dynamics. And of course, the relaxation rates, T1, T2, and T1 raw, um, can um, look at faster and slower dynamics. Um, so that kind of mitigates uh, the range of dynamics. Great, thanks. So very a very wide range, thank you. Yes. Uh, so I'm not seeing any uh, I'm not seeing any questions yet being entered into the Q and A, um, mm -hmm. but uh, I have, I guess I have a I have another question about um, uh, fast magic angle spinning. Um, so mm -hmm. I, so uh, I wonder um, you mentioned how many of these experiments you have to tailor the the type of experiment that you do the pulse sequence that you have to do um, to whether you're spinning 
fast and using proton detection, or you're spinning slower and using uh, carbon detection mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or some other detection. Uh, could you say something about using detection with other nuclei, uh, such as phosphorus or fluorine, and what are the advantages of spinning faster or slower with, uh, in, in, the, in that regime? Uh, so it really depends on the chemical shift and isotropy. So for phosphorus, for example, in some cases, there is large chemical shift and isotropy. Uh, so it also kind of depends on the sample. Uh, but for nitrogen, for example, nitrogen detection is also feasible at spinning speeds slower than 10 kilohertz. But it's just kind of, a, um, you know, this game between uh, what gives higher sensitivity, hence the magnetic ratio, and uh, how, the CS how broad is the CSA. So if the CSA is really strong, they will have um, stronger spinning sidebands. We will need higher MAS frequencies. Okay, thanks. And what about fluorine detection? And fluorine uh, nice that you ask that. So for fluorine, so fluorine, it's funny because I just um, this is really one one of my products right now in the lab is really fluorine um, MAS and mass spectroscopy. And um, so fluorine also depends greatly on the chemical shift and isotropy. So. Actually, just a few days ago, I saw an example of a fluorine um, nuclei with very large chemical shift anisotropy, where we, they see spinning sidebands really strong at 50 kilohertz. But it's not something we usually see in biological solids, for example. So mostly for fluorine, at least 40 kilohertz is acquired, but we also see that faster MAS frequencies uh, still benefit res with resolution. It also depends on whether we have or not have proton decoupling, for example. Uh, some probes do have a proton channel for decoupling with fluorine, but some mm -hmm. are limited to only fluorine. So it also depends on, on that. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, so we have a question from an anonymous attendee uh, who asks, can you elaborate on the dynamics measurements, for example, codex versus dip, sh dip shift? Um, it's, it's a bit complicated into getting, getting into the power sequence. Um, I can at least direct it to the literature. Um, it's... Um, well, so, so for deep shift, for example, and pulse, both recouple the dipolar couplings. And honestly, same codex rely more on the chemical shift anisotropy. So it, it also depends on the magnitude of the CSA. For, so, so for example, fluorine has very large chemical shift anisotropy, so it actually can infer on uh, faster dynamics. But nitrogen, if it has a smaller chemical shift anisotropy, then it's uh, slow. Then it's um, um, dynamics on the longer time scale, closer to the to the millisecond, microsecond. Um, so there are a lot of specifics there, and also which nuclei I recouple on. So you can also get actual different um, information if you recouple, for example, proton CSA or you recouple carbon CSA. I hope I answered the question. But yeah, sorry, because just getting into the past sequences is just a bit. Sure, sure. Uh, so another question from an anonymous attendee uh, who asks, uh, can you talk about the effects of fast spinning on the sample well-being? For example, temperature, pressure, and also to comment on the, uh, so I guess maybe starting with that, what are the effects of spinning fast on the sample well-being? Well, one point I want to mention that is very important. So there is something called frictional heating. So the faster we spin in metric angle spinning, the more the sample will heat and the more cooling it will be acquired. Also, it depends on what probe we have, if it's narrow bore, wide bore. There are a lot of parameters that affect on that and the size of the rotor. So 60 kilohertz with one probe will not be 60 kilohertz with a smaller rotor, for example. It will be different frictional heating. But it, it is very important that when we go to very fast MAS frequencies, we have large degree of heating from simply spinning the sample. So if you just spin without cooling, you can heat your sample to about 40 and 60 Celsius, and it would be very unfortunate. And also, for example, if you go to smaller rotors and spin them relatively slowly, you can achieve much lower temperatures below zero Celsius. And of course, it depends how you cool for cryogenic temperatures and et cetera. Um, I can also say that there was an example of the HPV capsid, which was studied at 150 kilohertz, that still gave high resolution spectra. So uh, still the very strong um, G forces uh, didn't kill the sample. Um, but that's about it. Um, it I, I do admit it, that if you think about it, the G forces in the MAS rotor, it's important to consider, are actually uh, stronger than what you would um, achieve usually with the centrifugation that you use to pack a sample or to sediment it. Uh, 
so this is yeah this is a consideration but for for most of the samples for at, at least i can say for the ajv uh studies in our group i know that they also um, unpack the samples afterwards in some cases to look uh to collect temp images and see if the samples are still intact and um also actually in filamentous bacteriophages in the intact uh phages in some cases they after they pegulated it and packed it and uh, conducted some experiments. They unpacked some of those samples and checked that they're still uh, the infectivity of the samples, um, which in which still uh, was the case. Um, so I can still at least say that in some cases, indeed, um, it was tested whether the um, samples are still viable or not after spinning. Um, but also a point is that if the sample, um, if the protein denaturates during your experiment, you will see, you will see the spectra uh, change very drastically because you will see the resolution and chemical shift perturbation and stuff like that. And in some cases, it, it may happen. And this is something that we need to look for. Thank you. So we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, when you have when you have to do some site specific labeling, what determines the choice of sites that you have to label? Can you repeat it again? Sure. So the question is when you have site-specific labeling, uh, I assume this means isotope labeling, what determines the choice of site that you have to label? I, I want to assume that maybe site-specific labeling is in, um, because there are so many ways to label samples. You could do spouse labeling by carbon, and you could just choose specific amino acids that you want to label, or if you want to um, uh, use fluorination. Um, it's it it's really case by case. Um, even for fluorination, there are many ways to uh, do uh, protein fluorination by incorporating tryptophan and different positions of tryptophan or tyrosine. So there are, there are just many ways, and sometimes it's just the one that works out. Um, but um, it's it's really differs for different cases. Um, it's really a case by case question, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, so here, so uh, okay. So let's see. So I have a couple of questions for for you. Um, so uh, a question about low temperature NMR, NMR uh, under DNP conditions. Yeah. Um, so how do how does operating at low temperatures, uh, like the example that you showed, where they were. Uh, cryogenic NMR was used to measure contacts between proteins and RNA. Uh, mm -hmm. How does that affect the resolution um, for these large viral assemblies? Well, definitely it, for, for example, for, so again, it, it's again, case by case dependent, but, but generally when we go to much lower temperatures, then um, the T2 relaxation is also much shorter and we have broader lines, so it may be difficult, but um, in many cases, at least, it's possible to resolve some of the residues uh, still um, by um, uh, three, uh, three dimension experiments, some double quantum um, uh, recoupling. But also in, in many cases, an AJV capsid is one case where you have high heterogeneity, then some of the broadening is not just because the T2 is shorter, it's because now you see uh, peaks corresponding to the different conformers and not one average peak. So um, well, it, it, the broadening is actually a source of information if it's because um, it, it most probably won't be very homogeneous. So it may be some sort of information on the heterogeneity. Um, but in, in the, so, yeah, the broadening is a, a challenge for DNP. But um, well, actually, it's very nice still that here the uh, line width actually is very nice for the uh, DNP contacts they were able to collect for PF1. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. So one more question. Um, so uh, in uh, sequences where you're recoupling CSA, um, mm -hmm. the those sequences can be very unstable to uh, uh, spinning instabilities under fast MAS. Is that a concern? Um, well, it's it's not usually at least usually the MAS stability is close to plus minus five maybe plus minus 10 hertz and at least we didn't see any um, effect on that but even if even if it happens it will cause maybe 
um, slight broadening of the line shapes of those kind of experiments. But the existing stability that we have for samples is um, is not hurting those recoupling experiments. 